all somebody had to say was, hey, did you see, you know, you'd get a better shot if you moved a little closer to the camera. That's all someone had to say. <laughs> I didn't ask for much. Pointers, uh, feedback, stuff, stuff to improve on. Say something, you pricks. Anyway, here's Dragon Quest VI. Nailed it. Oh boy, this is gonna be tough. Dragon Quest games have a very simple formula hard set in old school RPG values. Yeah, they try something new with each game they make, but the last word anyone would use to describe Dragon Quest with is complicated. And you know what? It's the simplicity of these games that make them so popular. Anyone can pick it up and play it. Unless we're talking about Dragon Quest VI. Dragon Quest VI is complicated and not in a good way. The game starts like any other... Dragon Quest VI is a huge callback to... So there's a lot of additions in this one that, uh... Uh... Guys, let me level with you. I've been tearing sheets out of this notebook for over two days trying to figure out how to write this episode, and I can't. Reason being that this game's problems apply a form of circular logic in order to justify themselves, which makes it very difficult for me to choose what to begin with. The rest of this episode is being written as a stream of consciousness, and if you can't keep up with me or get confused, it's okay. That's exactly what playing Dragon Quest VI is like. I don't think this game is on par with Dragon Quest standards, but even so, it still made some very important contributions that we need to cover. You might have noticed that the monster arena hasn't gotten much play since I mentioned it in Dragon Quest 3. It didn't change at all in Dragon Quest 4, and it was totally absent from Dragon Quest 5. I guess Chunsoft had finally realized that you could save scum casino tokens using it. But Heartbeat decided the monster arena deserved a fresh new face. It became the slime arena, and you couldn't place bets on monsters anymore, but you could enter your own slime type monsters into battle and earn prizes for winning. Now, in the original Dragon Quest Quest 6, they lowered the amount of tameable monsters from 40 in Dragon Quest 5 to 18, and you could only tame a total of 15 at a time. In the DS remake, they realized it wasn't worth having it in its current state and removed monster taming altogether, replacing it with being able to recruit NPC slime monsters you met in towns and dungeons. When you entered a slime in the arena, you would pick a rank to enter and your slime would fight the battles on its own as an AI. If it won, you'd earn a special reward. This is a significant change that a special game will use effectively in the future. If you had annotations on in the Dragon Quest V video, you would know that I fucked up and incorrectly said that the bag was introduced there. I was wrong. Heartbeat made the bag in Dragon Quest VI. Unlimited inventory space meant no need for item vaults, but there was a need to store money away, so item vaults became banks. To make navigation faster, the party now moved twice as fast in towns and dungeons than they did in the overworld. In addition, wells could now be looked into and explored in, and there were specific well monsters that could attack you inside them. Doors now opened automatically if the player ran into them and had the appropriate key. I know this should have been a that was new segment, I just couldn't find enough reaction clips. DISAPPOINTED! And they also introduced a new stat called Charisma, but it's not important because it sucks. Your weapons and armor would change your charisma like fashion points and it sucks. You only needed this stat for one part of the game and it's just a matter of having enough points in it to win a contest for a key item you need to beat the game and it sucks. What didn't suck was how mini medals worked in Dragon Quest VI. Now previously, mini medals were a currency that you spent for powerful items. In Dragon Quest VI, they were changed into static collectibles. Collect a certain amount of mini medals, and the mini metal king would bestow upon you a special item. Instead of a shop system, it worked more like getting rewards for hitting certain milestones. This is how the modern mini metal system works, unless we're talking about Dragon Quest IX, which brings the old system back. Instead of buying multiples of the same item, or only being able to ultimately own one of each mini metal reward of the six available to you, 
This new system expanded the amount of rewards you got, and because you could get more rewards sooner, the relevancy of mini medals stayed a lot stronger throughout the whole game. You didn't have to save up your mini medals anymore. As soon as you had enough for the next milestone, you could take advantage of a cool new item. That should cover the important stuff, but if I forgot something, I'm sorry. There's a lot of games and I'm using all these wiki pages and they all look the same, so sometimes I read the wrong one and I'm only human and it's very confusing. Incredibly not confusing was the return of the job system, or as they were called in this game, vocations. Each character in your party could take on a vocation, and that's how they earn spells and abilities. Winning battles under a vocation would increase your mastery in it, and mastering certain vocations was needed to take on more advanced vocations with stronger abilities. Switching vocations didn't reset your progress in any of them, and you could preview what you would learn under that vocation. You couldn't make your own characters like you could in Dragon Quest 3, but your roster was big enough for each member to take one of each basic vocation to start. It was a clever expansion to a system we hadn't seen in a long time. The previous job system was very basic and you'd typically only change a party's classes once or twice. Having an advanced vocation to build towards provided a sense of direction where there originally wasn't any, and knowing what vocation gave which abilities helped you form an idea of what you wanted your party to look like. And you'd be seeing a lot of use out of this job system too, because the random battle rates were increased to speed up vocation mastery. And here's the problem with kicking up the random battle rate in Dragon Quest. The combat is not that fun. Now I'm not saying it wasn't fun to fight monsters in previous games. It's just that combat in Dragon Quest has a certain repetition to it that becomes very tedious if the time between two battles is too short. This is a problem that the original versions of these games had. Dragon Quest IV, the most balanced of the remade titles, had this problem in spades in the original release. Maybe back in the day this was okay because it was what people expected. We didn't have many other examples of random battles in other RPGs, but when every other remade title fixed this issue, why didn't Dragon Quest VI? Well, because the job system needed battles as points for progression. Of course, I could be talking crazy and it could have just felt like there were more battles because of how poor the enemy design was in Dragon Quest VI. None of the actual art was bad, though I do have some reservations, but the actual number of enemies in this game, both new and old, was staggeringly low. For example, this gargoyle enemy is an early boss that gets reused as a regular enemy early on. There's nothing wrong with that, until that same gargoyle enemy persists to show up in every battle for the next 10 hours. Imagine if you were playing Pokemon, and for the next 5 cities over, every trainer you battled had a Caterpie. You would be fucking sick of fighting Caterpie. You would petition to get Caterpie removed from future Pokemon games. The difference between Pokemon and Dragon Quest is in Pokemon, they can't paint Caterpie blue, call it Bluterpie, and make you keep fighting those for the rest of the game. This was done over and over in Dragon Quest VI with multiple enemies. I don't have a problem with recoloring enemies to make stronger variants, but there needs to be a rest period, otherwise the player is going to react to random battles negatively. I swear to god, if I have to fight Lexington one more time, Oh god, there's two of them! Now compound this issue with yet another facet of Dragon Quest VI that wasn't up to par with its predecessors. Dragon Quest V breathed life into Dungeoneering with clever ideas to encourage active participation from the player. There was a trick to getting through each dungeon, and all the dungeons were concise and not any bigger than they needed to be, a perfect example of intelligently using space. Not only were there no clever gimmicks of any kind to any of the dungeons in Dragon Quest VI, but the dungeons themselves were massive. The mechanics in these dungeons didn't take thought, but rather time. Push this switch, so you can push this switch, so you can push this one right here, so that the staircase opens up. Hello, I thought this really long way. So fuck. Compare this static series of events to figuring out how to set up a track in such a way that a minecart will move along the desired route. Do you see the difference here? The difference between forcing the player to take an action 
and forcing the player to consider multiple actions. One is fulfilling, entertaining even. The other is only there to extend time. Dragon Quest IV didn't have the kind of dungeons that V had, but it didn't waste your time with long hallways and multiple floors. Long hallways and multiple floors meant to provide more random battles to push you further along your vocations. Because although the vocation system was this game's greatest strength, it was so catered to that everything else suffered for it. Why do I have to fight so much? Well, because if you didn't, you wouldn't get enough vocation masteries. Why are the dungeons so long? So that you can fight a lot. Why do I need so many battles to level up vocations? Because if you didn't, you wouldn't have anything to do in the long ass dungeons. And that is the circle of logic I mentioned earlier. To improve the gameplay, all that needed doing was a tweak to the number of battles one would need to master vocations and the truncation of these dungeons. But because one feature's condition was being used to justify the other, it seemed like it made perfect sense as it was. But that's only when you ignore possibilities that break that convenience the circle provides. And most disappointing of all, this turned every dungeon into a buffer for a boss battle against an otherwise unworthy opponent. If you were smart enough to leave the dungeon to heal, come back and make a beeline to the boss, then you would have beaten every boss handily. The question was no longer do you have the abilities to feasibly win this fight, it was now how much HP and MP do you still have left after walking through that Big ass dungeon. The one bastion of challenge, or change of pace even, in Dragon Quest was gone, and they had the added audacity to recolor a normal enemy and turn that into a boss fight. And something really mind boggling? They removed the ability to swap out active party members from the wagon in dungeons too. You seem like a sensible human being. Who does that? I'd say that I spend about 70% of my game time in dungeons, so without the option to change my lineup, half of the actual party was unusable during that time. This especially didn't make sense because you could still cast spells with these wagon characters inside of the dungeon even though you couldn't use them in battle. So what, is it like an amusement park ride? The trolley only sits four but your friends can ride in the trolley behind yours or something? Come to think of it, Dragon Quest VI does feel like a theme park ride. Everything's more or less on a track, there's a ton of animatronics that pop out every few seconds, and if you decide to get off the ride at any point in time, you'll be completely lost in the dark because all the lights will be off. In another callback to Dragon Quest 3, there are two, technically three, worlds in Dragon Quest 6, the physical world and the dream world being the two major locations you played in. The physical world is noticeably darker, while the dream world, the world everyone goes to when they dream, has paler tones to represent the fog-like vision one would have in a dream, or something like that. These worlds shared lots of things, obviously any character you met in the physical world had their dream counterpart that represented some kind of facet of themselves, I'll get to that in a second. Every town had a dream counterpart too, and yeah, you did get the impression that this was a cheap way of reusing the same locations twice, but the differences between the town counterparts and those of the people living in them provided more details that ultimately made these places more interesting. But I'm sure the difference you're most interested in is either worlds, modes of transportation, Time to boat in Dragon Quest VI is eight and a half hours, your first boat at least. In the dream world, instead of a boat, you sail a floating island. Yeah, it's got like a steering wheel and an inn and a few skeletons and it's a... Uh, it's a floating drivable island, what do you want me to say? Finally free to explore anywhere you wanted. As long as you don't sail past this floodgate right here. Before you do that, we need to make sure you visit all of these places first so you can get your special story events. Then we're going to have to ask you to make sure you do the same in the dream world. Now, you just need to sign these forms with your first initial last name, verifying that you've received your story in the correct order. Super. Please keep your hands, feet, and arms inside the vehicle at all times. Thank you for riding Dragon Quests Anywhere You Want Adventure. Exaggerating, clearly, but not that far off. This game split the open world into two halves, the inside and the outside, and it did this because they couldn't establish a narrative that made any sense without it. But here's the kicker, the story still 
doesn't make sense. Dragon Quest VI starts like most games in the series. Here's your villain. Oh no, he did a bad thing. Go get him. But then it swerves your expectations. Very early in the game, that big bad gets taken down and a prior revelation becomes the main plot of the game. It turns out that Murdaugh, the big bad you just beat, had split the hero's bodies from their dream counterparts, making them incomplete. What you could consider the second act of Dragon Quest VI then becomes about finding your other half in order to complete yourself, a pretty obvious metaphor for the journey of self-discovery, and a joke the newer localization runs into the ground. Oh, you say you're looking for your other half. My my, that's some pretty meaningful stuff. I hope you find the answers you're looking for. I lost where else in the footage this happens, but just imagine that with different sentence structure, but tens of times and picture me being agitated. And hey, you know what? This twist to the plot was something you were totally down for. It was still easy to follow, it was different, and it still gave you a reason for a quest. That's like three out of four on the list of enjoyable plots. But the minute you had access to a boat, this narrative started to fall apart and actively get in the way of your gameplay. The last time a Dragon Quest game was this open-ended about where to go next was 3, and in that game, every location had a self-contained adventure. You would show up at a village and they'd be all like, Ah, no, there's like a monster or something. Help us! And then you'd go into a nearby dungeon, fight the monster, go back to the village without ever needing to go anywhere else first, get some special item you needed to get to the final boss, and then you'd sail around until you found a new place with its own problems. All the while, people would be talking about your father and how huge his penis was to remind you of why you were doing all of this stuff in the first place. You could do this in any order you wanted to and the story would never be any more confusing. But in Dragon Quest VI, a lot of these little vignettes assume that you visited and completed other things in a particular order beforehand, despite that order never being enforced. As a result, the main plot loses itself among a billion questions you want to ask. Hurry, we must teach you this spell before the Archfiend strikes. I I'm sorry, who? I I'm just looking for a statue that looks like me. Hello? Man, GC, we better hurry and find these legendary relics. Wait, I thought we were searching for my other half. Hey, look, it's your other half. Why is he actually moving around when yours was just a statue? And why is it that people in the real world have dream counterparts that do whatever the hell they want, but we have to fuse with ours to be whole again? How come people that die can keep living in the dream world, even though people in the dream world are only there because someone else is sleeping? And how come the dream world is a real physical place if it's people's souls that inhabit it? Does that mean everyone but us has their soul physically manifested just a few miles above our heads? Are we soulless? Uh, look, it's one of Mortimer's generals. Let's get him! Don't you fucking ignore my questions. And who the fuck is Mortimer? What's worse is how uncommitted they were of establishing villains for anything longer than a battle's time span. Every boss, and I do mean every boss except for the big bad at the beginning, is introduced right before your battle with them and dies right after. And it's only after beating the last of his generals that someone finally clues you in on the secret evil they've been talking about out of context this whole time. Mortimer the Archfiend. Oh, well, now that you have a villain 26 hours into this 30 hour game, I suppose I should just start investing myself into the story. It sounds like I'm being unfair, but it's so exasperating to see such a simple formula that's worked so well in the past get blitzed on so many levels. And you know what? Had these scenarios been organized better so that they made a stronger, cohesive narrative? I'm sure I would have very much liked the story a lot more, because it's clear Mr. Hori's strengths in that regard haven't waned. The dialogue was great. And despite the rest of its failings, Dragon Quest VI managed to deliver some strong main characters. Maybe the strongest in the series so far. Dragon Quest VI's vignetting excelled when it was being used to flesh out the main characters. Well, most of the main characters. I really don't know why this person is here. I can't remember his name or what his deal is. He's got glasses and horns on his hat, so maybe he's some kind of nerdy BDSM stripper? Uh... Okay, so just the hero, Carver, Millie, and Terry. But these four get their time to shine and present who they are, and there's a lot to them. Carver is an impatient, impulsive workhorse that's focused on getting things done, which incidentally lends to his natural building skills. 
Millie is kind, gentle, very independent, and willing to hold her own to get what she wants. Terry is mysterious, the guilt of past actions influencing him down a path of darkness before the hero rescues him. And our player character is a courageous soul, willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for those he cares about. Hey, wait a second. Hmm. Hmm. I have a theory. A game! Stop it. Dragon Quest VI was delayed for a year during its development, and I think in no small part due to Chrono Trigger's huge success. Given the nine-month space between the two, it isn't too far-fetched to believe that the development team caught wind of Chrono Trigger and how successful it was probably going to be. Especially considering that Toriyama and Hori himself were working on both. Maybe Hori thought Dragon Quest VI was going to need a little more panache to stand tall next to Chrono Trigger. That constantly flip-flopping plotline is a strong indication of the team having one idea, but then scrapping parts of it to make space for something more similar to Chrono Trigger's time travel story, hence the ambiguously defined dream world full of contradictions. This change to the plot was also an extension of game length itself, which would explain why the dungeons in this game aren't as well designed, and why there's a heavy dependence on a combat system that just can't hold the game up on its own. It makes sense. The only consistent part of this game is its combat, because it's the only thing that wouldn't be affected by a sudden expansion of the world. But I could just be fucking wrong. And I think we're done here. This is a game I'm going to use in the future as an example of a bad game with a lot of polish. It has all of these problems, right? But because all of those problems don't break the game per se, and aren't particularly offensive, plenty of people have probably played it just fine. Dragon Quest VI sold millions of copies when it released, but in no way does it match any of the games in the franchise in terms of quality and design, and though it deserves the credit for making a lot of big changes that have benefited the series, it screws so many things up, and it is a challenge to screw that many things up. But then again, it's not awful, and even though I wouldn't recommend it as your first Dragon Quest, it's something you could still check out if only to know what a bad Dragon Quest game looks like, which is still not garbage. God, but it's such a slog that's not worth the 30 hours either. Alright, here's a great way to describe it. When Dragon Quest VI came out, a student was arrested for threatening another student during an escalated argument. Apparently, the argument began when the two students started discussing which Dragon Quest was the best one, with the student that made the threat advocating that Dragon Quest VI was the best game in the series. Possible mental issues and everything else we've talked about taken into consideration, that dude was fucking crazy!